Good evening. Um, can people in the back row hear me? Yes! Great. I, I didn't say raise your hand if, uh, if you can't hear me. Um, my name is Sherry Litwack, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Concord Free Public Library Corporation. We are delighted to have such a wonderful crowd. For your safety, please note the closest exit, and in the unlikely case of an emergency, please fold your chair and leave through the closest exit. And a friendly reminder to turn off your cell phones. Is it's been exciting to see so many ways that the 150th anniversary of the publication of Little Women is being celebrated, including films, books, articles, and television series. New audiences are gaining appreciation for Louisa May Alcott, and old fans are renewing their appreciation and admiration. We are honored to have two Alcott scholars, Joel Meyerson and Daniel Sheely, present a joint lecture this evening, and I found out that this is the first time that, they've done, that they have done this together. So that's very special. And they'll be sharing, sharing the reality rather than the myth of Alcott and her family, I'm sure. The Concord Free Public Library has the largest collection of original working manuscripts by Louisa May Alcott, including some pages from Little Women, as well as many of the original illustrations by Frank Thayer Merrill. We invite you to come back to the library to see these manuscripts and illustrations and learn more about them on our website. We hope you also have the opportunity to come back to the library on October 26 for a lecture by John Madison, Pulitzer Prize winning author of Eden's Outcasts. This talk is sponsored by Orchard House, home of the Alcotts, as part of the Concord Festival of Authors. We also wanted to mention and like to invite you to a public forum to hear more about the library's expansion plans on October 18th at six o'clock at the townhouse if you're interested. This program would not be possible without the support, dedication, and many hours of work by our wonderful staff, particularly Leslie Wilson, Curator of Special Collections, Connie M Minoli, Assistant Curator, Carrie Cronin, Library Director, Caroline Nee, Technical Services, Marcy Boulay Echo, Director, Director of Development, and Laurie Toussignon, Development Assistant. It is now my pleasure to present Leslie Wilson, curator of the William Monroe Special Collections of the Concord Free Public Library, and please join us for refreshments following the program. I'd like to add my personal welcome to the library celebration of the 150th anniversary of the first publication of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. 2018 is actually the first of two Little Women anniversary years since the book came out in two parts, the first in 1868 and the second in response to readers who wanted to know what happened to the March sisters when they grew up uh, in 1869. This anniversary holds meaning for a wide range of Alcott fans, scholars and students of American literature, young women who find inspiration in one or another of the four main female characters in the book, most often in the very independent Joe. Girls for whom the struggles of the March sisters on their way to womanhood resonate. Women writers empowered by the success of Joe as an author and by the superstar status Louisa May Alcott herself achieved through Little Women. Readers from all over the world who treasure Alcott's presentation of close, loving, and supportive family. And those who see in the real life story of Louisa May Alcott accepting the challenge of writing Little Women, an example of a strong woman who faced a hard life, figured out what she could do to improve it, and pulled herself up by her bootstraps to liberate herself and her family from hardship. Allow me to make a confession. I'm one of those more deeply moved by the real Louisa May Alcott's courage and triumph in deliberately crafting work for the literary marketplace than by her actual literary product. Despite initial doubts, she spoke to a large and eager audience 
at a time when women scarcely had a public voice. Simultaneously realizing her writerly aspirations, elevating her condition, and encouraging other women. The details of the writing and publication of Little Women and of Alcott's subsequent work constitute a powerful expression of feminism in action. And those details, as captured in her surviving working manuscripts, are the focus of tonight's program. Some of you know that the Concord Free Public Library special collections include a major archive of Alcott's working manuscripts. The library, for a long time, has had two chapters of the second part of Little Women. You can actually see one in the showcase over against the wall and take a look at it after the lectures are over. And two chapters of Little Men in manuscript. Recently, I was thrilled to be able to build on these and related holdings through the purchase with funding provided by the Concord Free Public Library Corporation of large portions of the manuscripts for Eight Cousins and Under the Lilacs as Alcott prepared them for serial first publication in the magazine St. Nicholas prior to their appearance as books. Given the riches that are stewarded here, I welcome this anniversary as an opportunity to raise awareness of how such materials illuminate Alcott in the process of fulfilling her potential. There are no better equipped Alcott scholars in the country to do so than tonight's speakers, Joel Meyerson and Daniel Sheely, both of whom have greatly advanced Alcott's scholarship and appreciation by making the author's letters and journals and literary writings readily available to modern readers in well-edited and annotated form, and both of whom have used the Alcott collections here at the library for decades in the course of their work. Joel Meyerson is Carolina Distinguished Professor of, of American Literature Emeritus at the University of South Carolina. He's published many books dealing with 19th century New England writers, transcendentalism, and the transcendentalists. His most recent publication is Picturing Emerson and Iconography, which I was privileged to co-author with him and which was published in 2017. Joel has done research in the Concord Free Public Library special collections since 1970, which makes him even more of an old timer than I am. <laughs> Daniel Sheely is professor of English at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He's published a number of books on Louisa May Alcott, the most recent of which was Little Women, an annotated edition, published by the Harvard University Press in 2013. Together, Joel and Dan co-edited the selected letters of Louisa May Alcott, the journals of Louisa May Alcott, and Louisa May Alcott, selected fiction. Along with Madeline Stern, they also co-edited two collections of Alcott's thrillers, A Double Life and Freaks of Genius. Please welcome Joel Meyerson and Daniel Sheely. Daniel and I would both like to thank the Concord Free Public Library Corporation for their generosity in inviting us and in hosting this event. We'd also like to give our recognition to Madeline Stern who was the first person to write a serious academic biography of Louisa May Alcott based on her reading of Van White Brooks's books, and also who did the first uh, full bibliography of the writings of Louisa May Alcott. We were very lucky to have her collaborate with us on our books. And finally, the most important announcement, we will get you out of here before 8.09 when the first pitch is thrown. <laughs> In late 2016, the Concord Free Public Library announced the acquisition of significant portions of the manuscripts to Louise May Alcott's novels, Eight Cousins and Under the Lilacs. They were not added to the library's extensive collections of Concord authors for bragging rights. As Leslie Wilson explained in an interview with the Maine Antique Digest in January 2017, we're not a glorified antiques roadshow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm channeling Leslie. <laughs> Uh, we're not a glorified antiques roadshow. It, it's not about things that have artifactual value or dollar value. It's, a things, it's about things that have research value. Now they join the other manuscripts in the library's Alcott collections, including the manuscripts of two chapters each from Little Women and Little Men. Today, Daniel Sheely and I will take up Wilson's challenge 
and examine the holdings of the library's Alcott collections and discuss how this material illuminates not only Alcott's writing process, but also her professional relationships with her publishers, notably Roberts Brothers of Boston. Part of our discussion will explore the background to the manuscript of Under the Lilacs before examining the manuscript itself. Unfortunately, because of time constraints, we won't be able to deal with eight cousins. We'll also discuss the surviving manuscript leaves to Little Women at the Library, Alcott's relations with her publishers, Robert's Brothers and Mary Mapes Dodge of St. Nicholas, and with her illustrators, notably Frank T. Merrill. Let's start tonight where the fame began, Little Women. Thank you. Um, let me begin by briefly summarizing the publication of Little Women. It's an old story that many of you have heard, but uh, just to cap some of the highlights of it. In September 1867, Louisa May Alcott famously recorded in her journal, Niles, partner of Roberts, asked me to write a girl's book, said I'd try. Although Alcott had tasted a small success with hospital sketches in 1863, she was yet unprepared for the fame and fortune Roberts Brothers Publishers of Boston was about to bring her. In June 1868, she mailed 12 chapters to Thomas Niles, who, like Alcott herself, considered it dull. But she firmly resolved, quote, to try the experiment for lively, simple books are very much needed for girls. Despite what Alcott had written about Niles thinking the novel dull, his letter to her on 16 June indicated otherwise. I have read the 12 chapters and am pleased. I ought to be more emphatic and say delighted, so pleased to consider judgment as favorable. Niles, who had first suggested the book, also offered Alcott a title, one that would soon become Household Words. What do you say to this? Little Women, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, The Story of Their Lives by Louisa M. Alcott, first series. With Niles' title, there would be no mistaking that Alcott's work was a book for girls. The first edition sold out in October, with another 1,000 sold in November. By the end of the year, approximately 4,500 copies of Little Women or Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy had been printed. Alcott and Niles were off to a promising start. By the end of October 1868, Louisa moved to Boston where she could have quiet solitude as she now readied herself for undertaking what Niles had been encouraging, Little Women, part second. Her plan was, quote, to do a chapter a day, and in a month, I mean to be done. The second part of Little Women appeared in bookshops on 15 April, 1869. However, Thomas Niles had already written Alcott earlier that month, telling her that 3,000 copies of part two had been pre-sold, and the 4,000 was now being printed. Over 30 years from the publication of part one of Little Women in 1868 to the sale of their firm to Little Brown in 1898, Roberts Brothers printed 1,727,551 copies of Louisa May Alcott's books. Despite the popularity of her other works, Alcott never repeated the success of Little Women. During her lifetime alone, Roberts Brothers printed 67,000 copies of the trade edition of Part One and 65,000 of Part Two. Once the two volumes were combined into one, the press printed 60,350 copies of Little Women from 1881 through 1887. Since Alcott was the most famous and most popular author in America, or one of the most popular authors in America at her death in 1888, one would think that manuscripts of her work would have been saved by her publisher, by Alcott herself, or even by her family. But unfortunately, that is not the case. So precious little is known to exist, and the Concord Free Public Library is the repository for a good portion of this literary treasure. One would also hope that at least the manuscript for Little Women would have been kept, as it was the story of the Alcott family in fictional form. And think of what that manuscript would reveal. Why, for instance, did Alcott think the first 12 chapters dull? Did she cut chapters or totally revise others? Did the plot change at all? 
Alas, the sole clues we have to such questions are contained in only two existing manuscript chapters of part two of Little Women, both of which permanently reside right downstairs in special collections. While these two chapters yield some interesting facts, they also create even more questions all of which makes wonderful fodder for literary research on a novel that has never been out of print since 1868. Why do only two of these manuscript chapters exist? First, Alcott, when writing to Thomas Niles in July of 1868, sends him both corrected proofs and 10 new chapters, which means she's still composing the final chapters of part one while the publisher has already set type for the earlier portion. She informs Niles, as I don't remember it very well, I may have missed some of the threads. The small remark now tells us that she kept no clean copy of the manuscript that she sent to press, nor did she appear to have her own working draft that she could consult. Since the two volumes of Little Women were written so closely together, we can assume the same process was followed for the second volume. Now this brings us to an interesting question. Are the manuscript copies of part two here at the Concord Free Public Library, the final clean copy sent to Roberts Brothers? If so, why were only two chapters kept? But a close inspection tells a more fascinating story. The two surviving chapters are our foreign correspondence, which details some of Amy's adventures in Europe, and heartache, the chapter where Joe tells Laurie she does not love him and could never marry him. Why were those two chapters singled out to keep? On the back of one of the leaves, Alcott herself penned the following. Part of the manuscript of Little Women, written in Boston, saved by mother's desire. Were these Abigail Alcott's favorite chapters? Were they the ones Louisa herself selected? Were they just random chapters that happened to be at hand when Miss Alcott made the request? Were they the only two kept or were there others that disappeared over the years as Alcott herself went through her papers? Later, after Louisa's death, Anna Alcott Pratt and her two sons, John and Fred, also sorted the author's papers. We most likely will never know the answer to these questions. Despite these mysteries, the two chapters tell us significant facts about Alcott's writing process as she composed her most famous work. Our foreign correspondence yields the most clues. And because of time constraints tonight, I will confine my remarks to this chapter. As you can see, Alcott wrote in ink on lined blue paper. It's a relatively clean copy. There are few deletions and insertions, all done in pencil or different ink, which tells us these minor changes were made upon rereading the text. But a careful examination of the manuscript chapter shows us that it is quite different from the final published one. A number of descriptive passages about England from the perspective of Amy and Aunt March that are found in the published novel are missing in this chapter manuscript. However, the most significant change is that in the existing manuscript, Amy has a different lover. Not Fred Vaughn, Laurie's British friend that we meet in Camp Lawrence chapter in part one. Instead, it is someone she meets on her European journey. In the published book, Amy, on the ship to Europe, meets a Mr. Lennox, who seems to play an inconsequential role and even disembarks at a different port before the marches. The same scene is found in the manuscript with even less detail. However, later in the manuscript, Mr. Lennox somehow receives a promotion and becomes Captain Lennox. <laughs> Suddenly, he reappears in Switzerland where he courts Amy. In the manuscript chapter, Fred Vaughn, who in the book seems ready to marry Amy when he joins the March party in Switzerland, and remember, she's willing to accept him, in the book, Fred Vaughn never, or excuse me, in the manuscript, Fred Vaughn never reappears after their initial meeting in London. Marriage to Fred is never even considered in the manuscript. When Amy realizes Captain Lennox is serious about their relationship, she writes Marmy. 
I never flirted, truly, mother. In the first place, he's homely and small and poor, and I don't care for him. I can't help it if foolish people will like me. <laughs> Alcott did not completely abandon all of this material in the final version, however. In the book, once she knows that Fred Vaughn is interested in her romantically, Amy writes Marmy and confesses she intends to marry him. Now notice the similarity here with Amy's words, which I'm about to read and from the published book, and what I just read from the manuscript. This is from the book. I haven't flirted, mother, truly, but remembered what you said to me and have done my very best. I can't help it if people like me. I don't try to make them. I'm not madly in love with Fred. I like him and we get on comfortably together. He is handsome, young, clever enough, and very rich. <laughs> Notice we quickly went from homely and poor to handsome and very rich. In the manuscript, Captain Lennox follows the march entourage from Switzerland to Heidelberg, Germany, where the castle there, Amy eventually suggests he travel on in Germany with his friend, thus eventually ending the courtship. In the published book, you will recall, Fred Vaughn arrives at the German castle, but does not propose to Amy. Instead, he informs her his brother Frank is seriously ill and he must return home. Thus, his departure leaves Amy free to be courted and eventually proposed to by Laurie. As you can see, all of these are significant changes. Why did Alcott make them? Did she act alone? Or did Niles offer his opinion on this earlier draft? No known existing correspondence between the author and publisher reveals an answer. Anne Boyd Rowe, in her recent edition of Little Women, published this past summer by Penguin, first shows some of these differences between the manuscript and the published book in her appendix. Rowe argues that Alcott, in making these alterations, quote, removed references to Amy's flirtatiousness, thus making the book more suitable for a younger audience. That argument makes sense, but the most significant revelation in these two existing manuscript chapters is that Alcott composed at least two different drafts of this part of the novel. Were there more than two? What important changes in the other missing chapters appeared in this manuscript draft? We most likely will never know. But it does disprove Alcott's claim later in life that she never returned to her work to edit it. She wrote aspiring author John Preston True in 1878, I never copy or polish, so I have no old manuscripts to send you. What Concord Free Public Library possesses is quite a treasure indeed, the earliest known drafts of a portion of Little Women, an enduring American <coughs> classic. But that's not the only useful research source in the archive here. As part of the Alcott Little Women holdings in the library is another unique collection. Not manuscripts, but drawings. As initial sales of Alcott's most famous novel began to slow over a decade, Niles had an idea to reintroduce readers to the book. Both volumes of Little Women went through several printings from their original publication until 1870, when Roberts Brothers issued the books as a two-volume set. Finally, in 1880, Niles decided to publish a one-volume edition of the novel for the Christmas trade, the illustrated Little Women, which looks like this, right? Nice volume. In October 1880, the firm advertised the book in Publishers Weekly. It is safe to say that there are not many homes which had not been made happier through the healthy influence of this celebrated book, which has now become a classic, and which is, in its present dress, a charming volume for the center table of the domestic fireside. This new deluxe edition of Little Women would contain over 200 illustrations by Frank T. Merrill. 
Born in Boston in 1848, Merrill had trained in the city, including the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Throughout his career, he was known primarily as a popular magazine and book illustrator, especially the standard classics for children. Working throughout the last half of the 19th century and even into the 20th century, Merrill, although now best known for his work with Alcott, illustrated such favorites as Cooper's Last of the Mohicans and Stevenson's Treasure Island. One year after completing the new one-volume Little Women, Merrill would go on to illustrate the first edition of Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper in 1881. But how would Alcott react to Merrill's illustrations? The author was always interested in the artwork for her books, especially when she had some control over the book's production. Her youngest sister, May Alcott, at Louisa's suggestion, had illustrated the first part of Little Women. Most readers would agree, that was a mistake. In its October 1868 review of the novel, The Nation wrote, Miss May Alcott betrays not only a want of anatomical knowledge, but also the fact that she has not closely studied the text which she illustrates. May Alcott's illustrations are amateurs at best and at worst, just plain bad. But you judge for yourself. Here is May's illustration for Meg at Vanity Fair, the episode in which Meg attends the Moffat's Ball and is humiliated when her friends dress her up like a fashion doll. Louisa wrote to Thomas Niles in July 1868, sending him this illustration and saying, I like it but the engraver may see many faults and will please point out such as my sister can mend. I hope whoever engraves the blots won't spoil the pictures and make Meg cross-eyed. That's right, blame it on the engraver. <laughs> Needless to say, May Alcott improved as an artist and those of you that know me know I'm a big champion of May Alcott. But it's important to note that never again would she illustrate one of her sister's books, not even the sequel to Little Women. For the second part of Little Women, Robert's brothers engaged the artist Hammett Billings, who had illustrated the first edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1851. By the way, Billings was also a designer and architect and created Concord's Soldiers Monument in 1867, the obelisk here on the town square memorializing the Concordians who died in the Civil War. So nice connection there. However, Alcott was not satisfied with some of the illustrations that Billings drew, and he only drew about four or five. And she wrote to her friend, the artist and illustrator, Elizabeth B. Green, in April 1869, complaining about the new illustrations. Oh, Betsy, such trials have I have had with that Billings no mortal creeter knows. He went and drew Amy a fat girl with a pug of hair sitting among weedy shrubbery with a lighthouse under her nose and a mile or two off a scrubby little boy on his stomach in the grass looking cross, towsley, and about 14 years old. It was a blow for that picture was to be the gem of the lot. I bundled it right back and blew Niles up to such an extent that I thought he'd never come down again. But he did, as brisk and bland as ever, and set Billings to work again. And here we'll see in our next slide the revised version, which became uh, also the frontispiece for Little Women Part Second. However, Alcott was still dissatisfied with Billings' revised illustration. You will shout when you see the new one for the man followed my directions and made, or tried to, Laurie, a mixture of Apollo, Byron, Tito, and Will Green. <laughs> Such a ba lamb, hair parted in the middle, big eyes, sweet nose, lovely mustache, and cunning hands, straight out of a bandbox and no more like the real Teddy than Ben Franklin. I wailed, but let go, for the girls are clamoring, and the book can't be delayed. 
Amy's pretty and the scenery is good, but my Teddy, oh, my Teddy. <laughs> well, given Alcott's reactions here, you can see why Thomas Niles might have been a bit nervous with this new Little Women venture, especially one that involved over 200 illustrations. However, as Louisa May Alcott looked over the new illustrations one rainy day in July 1880. She wrote Niles, assuring him that the drawings are all capital. She added, Mr. Merrill certainly deserves a good penny for his work. Such a fertile fancy and quick hand as his should be well paid, and I shall not begrudge him his well-earned compensation, nor the praise I am sure these illustrations will earn. Today, researchers interested in Alcott, Merrill, or even 19th century illustrations can obtain a better understanding and deeper appreciation for the give and take between author and illustrator in the process of creating a book. One of the treasures of the Alcott collection here at the library are 67 Merrill illustrations for little women. 63 of these are original drawings, plus three illustrations in proof form. Deposited by the Concord Antiquarian Society, now the Concord Museum, in 1971, this collection was eventually gifted to the library in 1974. If the holdings were just the drawings themselves, it would be a substantial collection by one of the 19th century's leading illustrators for children. However, what makes this collection so important is that many of these sketches are annotated by Alcott. Her comments on the back of the drawings reveal just how dedicated she was to the final book production. She wanted the illustrations to match her own imaginings of her characters. At times, Alcott in her comments commends Merrill with such remarks as, just right, capital, lovely, jolly, quite touching. However, at other times, the author is not pleased. Laurie looks very much older here than in the other pictures, about right here and rather too young elsewhere. Or, John Brooks should have a full short beard and a mild fine face. This is not good. Or, <laughs> good, but Jo was always made to look too old for her years. Let's take a look now at a few of these sketches. What we're looking at here is the back of one of the drawings. And by the way, the first one here that I'm going to talk about is a recent acquisition for the collection obtained from Skinner Auction House in Boston this past spring, right? As curator now of special collections, you always have to be, you know, alert to what is out there and going up on the market. In the book, the illustration appears in part two's chapter five, Domestic Experiences. The scene depicts Laurie seeing John and Meg's baby, Daisy and Demi, for the first time. Having been away from home, he's not aware that Meg gave birth to twins. So Joe, if you recall, surprises him by handing him both babies while he has his eyes closed. On the back of the sketch, Alcott has written, Laurie is rather homely, but the girls may like him. Don't see but one baby. Joe uncovered two when he shut his eyes. Two little ball pates would be funny. However, if you look at the drawing, you can clearly see two babies' heads here. Let's take a look. There's the front of the drawing now, right? And if you compare this sketch with the illustration in the book, you'll see they are identical. Now it's possible that Alcott missed the two babies' heads here, <laughs> or maybe even more possible that Merrill later was able to go back and easily add another ball pate here in a way that we can not detect now. As you'll see in some of the others, you can clearly detect his changes, but here you really can't. Um, so it's very possible he was able to go back in and Put another baby in there, I'm not sure. But he clearly ignored Alcott's comment about Laurie being homely and decided not to redo the character. Let's look at another. The next illustration appears in Joe's journal. 
chapter 10 of part 2. And again, we're looking at the back. In this scene, Jo, in her New York boarding house, accidentally hits her umbrella up against Professor Bear's door, and he immediately flings it open, holding a worn sock and a darning needle. Now, on the back of the sketch, Alcott has written... Can we go? Yeah, there we go. Uh, Alcott has written, Eyes too staring. Bear was not frightened of Joe. Much better, but still rather fantastic. A long dressing gown would be better than the dandy jacket he now wears. Now notice here that Alcott has struck through her first comment. I assume it's her strikeout. Also notice that her next comment is much better. But now she has another idea, how the professor should be dressed. Her initial comment indicates that she saw this sketch earlier and made the criticism about Bear's expression, but on a second go through she's satisfied with the alteration that Merrill created, so she deletes her first comment. Let's look at the front of the sketch. Let's go up. There we go. Okay. Now, you can clearly see that the artist drew another version of Bear's head and glued it to the original. <laughs> How industrious, right? And actually, I can't, shouldn't tell you this, but if you just, paper's a little loose, and if you <laughs> just lift just a little bit, you can really see the other illustration and what she's, what she's talking about. And I couldn't get, you know, a good picture of that, but it's there. <laughs> Trust me. Um, but notice that Bear decided not, um, excuse me, notice that Merrill decided not to change the clothing. This is the illustration that was eventually printed. Let's look at one more illustration here. Take a look at the back. Here we have a scene in Learning to Forget, chapter 18 of part two, where Laurie returns to see Amy in Europe, the first time since Beth's death and since he has realized Amy will be the one to fill Joe's place in his heart. On the verse of the sketch, Alcott writes, Laurie is rather stiff in his legs. A few mountains or glimpses of the lake would add to the effect. Now with that criticism, let's take a look at the front of the sketch. You'll notice that once again, Merrill has redone the illustration. I don't know if you can quite see this here, but he has drawn a completely new Laurie, right, and pasted it entirely over the old one, leaving Amy untouched. We can also surmise that the lake and the mountains in the background were added after Alcott's suggestion. Um, the Merrill collection here is truly remarkable and casts much light on how an author and an illustrator worked together. Now I'm going to pass it back to my colleague to continue the story. The history of Under the Lilacs shows how author and editor work together. The book was published serially in December 77 and October 1878 issues of St. Nicholas Magazine, edited by Mary Mapes Dodge, and then in book form in October 1878 by Roberts Brothers of Boston. The latter were the Alcott family's official publishers beginning in 1868 with Little Women and Bronson's Tablets. The firm kept Louisa in print through 1898 when they were bought by Little Brown. Because, the only, because only the St. Nicholas text was set directly from the manuscript, it's clear that it must have been saved by someone who was involved with St. Nicholas, and the obvious choice for that is Dodge, who is not only the editor, but a friend of Louisa's. Indeed, most of the surviving manuscripts for Alcott's works are setting copies for their appearances in St. Nicholas. Here we should comment that there are surprisingly few book-length manuscripts extant for 19th century authors, American authors. The only complete manuscript for a Melville novel, for example, is Billy Budd, and that's because Melville failed to complete it before his death. It wasn't published until 1924. Thoreau saved his manuscripts because their contents continued to be useful to him or because they were works in progress. And Whitman saved everything because he was a pack rat. <laughs> The manuscript to Emerson's Representative Men survives only because an employee at the publisher saved it. Even extant proof sheet sheets are scarce, while the ones for Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter and Thoreau's A Week and Walden 
are known, only those for Emerson's American Scholar address exist. And for Alcott, the only complete book manuscript that survives is from Joe's boys, and that because it remained in the family's possession. In nearly every case, a manuscript was saved because it had personal or sentimental value, and not because it had monetary value. This fact is reflected in early auction prices, especially in the famous 1924 Stephen H. Waitman sale, in which four manuscript journals by Thoreau, four manuscript journals, sold for between $160 and $410 each. A manuscript chapter from a week sold for $590, and the page proofs to a week for $375, whereas an inscribed copy of a week to Hawthorne went for $625, a triumph of sentiment and association over text. Why is this so? <clears throat> Mainly because for most of their lives, these authors were not considered important. Poe, Melville, Hawthorne, and Th I'm sorry, Thoreau, and Whitman did not have successful popular or financial careers, so compositors or publishers had no reason to save their materials. Many Emerson manuscripts were saved because the publisher, James D. Fields, retained and bound them for distribution to friends and libraries. And most of the Alcott manuscripts that are extant are ones published in St. Nicholas, saved in all probability by the editor, Mary Mays Dodge. In 1873, the 42-year-old Dodge, who had gained fame as the author of the 1865 children's novel, Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, was named editor of a new monthly periodical, St. Nicholas, subtitled Scribner's Illustrated Magazine for Boys and Girls. She soon wrote Alcott to ask if she would contribute. Dodge was one year older than Alcott, and like her, a single woman writer, in her case widowed, whose family depended upon her pen for their livelihood. Over the next 15 years, Alcott would be a mainstay of St. Nicholas and develop a friendship with Dodge, who understood the stresses of balancing a professional career with family responsibilities. Dodge also acted as the intermediary between Alcott and the compositors, working with Alcott on the text and her suggestions for illustrations. As editor and friend, Dodge would have recognized the importance of literary manuscripts by Alcott, arguably the most popular writer for children in the late 19th century, and kept them, as she also did Alcott's letters to her. At some point, the manuscripts for Eight Cousins and Under the Lilacs were obtained by a man named William Hobart Royce. Born in 1878 in Springfield, Massachusetts, Royce began his career in the book trade there before moving to New York City. After nearly 20 years, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1917, he joined the well-known Gabriel Wells Rare Book Firm, which he managed for over 30 years. The manuscripts probably came to him through his contacts in the trade. Royce married Edna Maria Wallen in 1908, <clears throat> and they had two daughters, <clears throat> Eva Allen Royce and Abby Anna Royce, born in 1910 and 1912, respectively. But in January and February of 1929, he gave two extraordinary birthday presents to his daughters. I hope there are no daughters' presents here when I hear this. Two note cards in Royce's hand accompany the manuscripts at the library. One says, to my dear daughter, Eva Allen Royce, on her 19th birthday, this manuscript of her favorite author, sound Papa. And the other says, to my dear daughter, Abby Anna Royce, on her 17th birthday, this manuscript of her favorite author, from Daddy. <laughs> nice gifts. There is no indication to which girl <clears throat> the Under the Lilacs manuscript was given. <clears throat> the, next, <clears throat> excuse me, the next document in the transmission history of the manuscripts is a note dated 19 March 1979 by Eva Allen Royce, the daughter, stating, to dear Sarah Graham Ketchum, because you're a devotee of Louisa May Alcott, as is your loving aunt Eva. And there the trail ends. Almost. At this point, your intrepid scholars dusted off their keyboards and started to use Google. The results are interesting. <clears throat> Abby Royce became a doctor in Brooklyn and was described by a descendant as the longtime <clears throat> best friend and partner in life to her maternal grandfather's sister, Beatrice Larson. Abby was a general practitioner with an office in the Brooklyn Brownstone on 50 91st Street that she shared with her father. She died in 1983. <clears throat> Eva Royce attended Mount Holyoke College in the early 1930s, later taught at Catalina High School in Tucson, Arizona, and died near there in 1994. 
She appears in the 1995 obituary of Elizabeth Phyllis Fratz of Tucson, <clears throat> where she is described as her friend of nearly six decades, who preceded her in death. Fratz was survived by, among others, her sister and brother-in-law, Mary Lou and George Ketchum. <clears throat> and they had, <clears throat> Mary Lou Fratz had married George Ketchum in 1934, and they had seven children. One of their children was James Rowe Ketchum, born in 1939. He and his wife Barbara had four children, one of whom is Sarah Graham Ketchum, the person to whom Aunt Eva passed on the Olcott manuscripts. The manuscripts were subsequently sold to the library and purchased through the good sense of <clears throat> Leslie Perrin Wilson and the trustees. Um, had they not, they would have gone on the market and the price they would have received would have been extraordinary. Under the Lilacs has both a straightforward plot and publishing history. 12-year-old Ben, who believes his father to be dead, and his dog Sancho escape from the circus and are caught, hiding by Bab and Betty Moss. They and their widow mother take in Ben and Sancho. The three children play and tell stories under the lilac trees, while Miss Celia works to improve Ben's character. Following many adventures, Ben's father shows up, marries Mrs. Moss, and the family is together under the lilacs, which incidentally are the last words in the book. Alcott wanted to <clears throat> try and get up steam for a new serial in June 1876, and in February 1877, thought of the book as one like Old Fashioned Girl. She agreed to be paid $3,000, and by June was able to write Dodge that 12 chapters were done and that the short ones would make six or seven numbers of St. Nicholas. However, she wrote, I am daily writing with anxiety for an illumination of some sort, as my plot is very vague so far. By 3 June, she was able to write Dodge that she planned to go and simmer an afternoon at A. Vanberg's Mammoth Menagerie and New Golden Menagerie in Boston, so that she could get hints for further embellishments of Ben and his dog. <clears throat> in Alcott's journal entry for 1877, September, about her mother's illness, she states, I foresaw a busy or sick winter and wanted to finish the book while I could, and earning my $3,000. Brain very lively and pen flew. It always takes an exigency to spur me up and wring out a book. Never have time to go slowly and do my best. She did indeed finish writing the book in September, and the 26th sent in the last six chapters, noting, I have selected the parts I should prefer for illustration. Mrs. Mary Howick Foote does not choose lively ones, and half the fun is spoiled by a spiritless picture. She was also willing to let Dodge use her own professional opinion in editing the piece. When you send me proofs, just mark here and there any alterations as to length, etc., which must be made, and I will try to adjust matters to suit. Alcott had long followed the advice of those she trusted, beginning with Thomas Niles' recommendation that she, she, that she keep the copyright to Little Women and thus ensure the Alcott family's financial future. Alcott's comment about the proofs <clears throat> brings us at last to the manuscript of Under the Lilacs. Those of us who've published anything in the last 20 years or so have participated in a streamlined process by which our, by which our works see print. A much worked over electronic file goes to a compositor who returns a PDF for the proof, which after our examination goes to the printer and becomes a book. In the 19th century though, <clears throat> things were much more complicated. <clears throat> The author went through drafts of the manuscript and then made a clean copy for presentation to the publisher. There was no Chicago manual of style then, so the treatment of such features as punctuation and spelling were left either to the publisher's own style sheet or the whims of the compositors. Under the Lilacs was published before the introduction of the linotype machine in 1884, and so was set letter by letter by people who put metal type into forms that held them. The galley proofs that were pulled from that type setting usually covering one and a half to two pages of the final text for proof, were sent to the author for correction and returned. The type was then rearranged to correspond to the final magazine or book page and printing began. The library's manuscript of Under the Lilacs is definitely the one that all could send to St. Nicholas. We know this because of the presence of penciled stint marks, so-called because they represent the amount each compositor set to define stint Think of the stint someone serves in the armed forces. Picture, please. And see up there on the top left, writing, saying 27 June, and then on the right, 
the name of the compositor and the date of St. Nicholas this would appear in. Compositors were paid by the word, and they marked either the beginning or the end of the material they set in type, always noting their name and often the number of words they set or estimated to be set. Both the names and word counts are present in this manuscript, making it absolutely clear it served as printer's copy. Also, most of the sections bear the name, the name, the date of the issue of St. Nicholas, in which they appeared written at the top. Three of the last chapters have Alcott's recommendations for what event should appear in the pictures, confirming her comment to Dodge in her letter of 3 June. Absent the working drafts, the printer's copy manuscript is as close as we can get to what the author intended. Good, clean manuscripts were beloved by compositors. Besides the obvious that they were easy to read, they also allowed the compositor to set type quickly and earn, earn money faster. They also made it easier to observe the old-time compositor's mantra, follow copy out the window. That is, do exactly what the author says. Or as one poet declared, Mr. Printer, follow copy, be it smooth or be it choppy, be it right or be it wrong, follow copy is my song. Mr. Printer, follow copy, I admit it's rough and sloppy, but it's what I want to say, follow copy, printer, pray. I didn't write that. <laughs> From my collation of the manuscript of Under the Lilacs against the St. Nicholas printing, <clears throat> I can make a number of generalizations, the most basic of which is that Alcott wrote only on the front of each manuscript leaf or the recto and left the back of the leaf the verso blank. Alcott was also still tinkering with the manuscript right before sending it to press. Next picture, please. Oh, you missed. Go back, please. You can see here, and there's a little bracket there, probably by an editor or publisher, Revision there, revision there, revision there, revision there. These are all changes she made in the manuscript. She le uh, other, elsewhere, she left an empty space for Mrs. Moss' name in the first few chapters, as well as changing a squire to a judge. A number of additions are inscribed in the back of leaves. In chapter 12, she added two more chapters, to, I'm sorry, two more book titles on the verse of De Ben's reading list. And in chapter 21, she made a re recommendation for a section to be left out if the chapter would run too many pages in print. Also, she uh, in, uh, inserted words she inadvertently left out. There are many examples where she changed a common word or expression for a more impressive one. Trying becomes endeavoring. Pretty plenty, numerous. The best, splendidly. Glanced at, surveyed. Something about crushing illusions and, in a bad way, unpropitious. Some revisions show her attempts to get just the right word. She changed under the root to below it, but still not satisfied, changed that to between. Isn't it sweet, becomes nice, finally becomes perfectly lovely. And rolled over to explain, becomes explained, becomes loftily inquired. Because her handwriting is often hand to hard to decipher, she clearly rewrote above the line how to spell Winham, the intelligent horses described in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Next, please. It's, sometimes it's hard to even read the interlineation, but trying to read what she first wrote down there, which probably was misspelled, is even harder. Other revisions clarify otherwise confusing scenes or references. When Ben couldn't help hearing part of a discussion outside the house, Alcott adds, as the windows were open, to explain why. When Celia asks to be shown a confectioner's and a candy store, Alcott changes the former to baker's, so as to distinguish between a bakery and a sweet goods shop. The reference to the prolific author John D. Quackenbos is an excellent example, for when Alcott deletes the manuscript reading of Celia knowing her Quackenbos very well, she does so for a couple reasons. First, Quackenbos hasn't been introduced yet, so the reader might not know who he is. Second, while Quackenbos wrote a number of geography and history texts for the young, he also authored a number of adult works on spiritualism. And Alga didn't want the reader to be confused as to which works Celia knew. Thus, she begins the next chapter with a reference to Quackenbos' Elementary History of the United States. There are three miscellaneous changes worth noting. First, Alcott revised the number of chapter titles. Next picture, please. You can see there. Second, there are three instances in all, all in the three final chapters 
where Alcott makes a suggestion for what scene should be illustrated. Because as she had written Dodge earlier, Foote failed to choose lively things to depict, but none of her ideas were followed. And third, the most interesting change is in chapter nine. In the final version of the manuscript she sent to St. Nicholas, a visitor tuned his little lyre afresh, but the original deleted manuscript reading was sweetly sung a la Walt Whitman. This tantalizing revision asked some questions. Did Alcott read Whitman's works? Did she make this deletion because of the notoriety Whitman's writings had achieved by 1877? We know that Alcott was familiar with Whitman through her father's interest in, with him, interest, sorry, interest in him. Frank Sanborn recalls that when Emerson and Thoreau considered inviting Whitman to Concord in 1860, none of the town women wanted him in their house. <laughs> but in 1876, Louisa asked Sanborn to obtain a copy of Leaves of Grass for her. And when Whitman visited Concord in 1881, Bronson wrote in his journal, Louisa is interested in Whitman and takes tea with us. A final point, <clears throat> spot checking the St. Nicholas text against the Roberts Brothers text shows that the book was set accurately from the magazine text, but with numerous changes in punctuation, undoubtedly because Roberts used a different style sheet than did St. Nicholas. The manuscript shows many similarities to other Alcott works of the period namely the revisions in Little Women done when the 1868 text was revised for this 1880 edition, and also the stories Eli's Education and Onawanda, published in respectively the March and April 1884 issues of St. Nicholas. The editors of the Northern Critical Edition of Little Women, Ann Phillips and Gregory Iselin, discussed the many changes between the 68-69 texts and the 1880 revised edition, and generalized that the latter modernized punctuation, especially by trimming the number of commas and semicolons, eliminated slang and regularized capitalization and hyphenation. Wesley Raven, studying Eli's education, noted similar, education, uh, similar changes to these, as did I when collating on Awanda, where, for example, Alcott's lowercase Christian in the manuscript becomes capitalized throughout in print. Before we conclude, we should note that while Alcott did read proof, and while her publishers often ask for her input about changes, she herself declared, punctuation is a free institution and all can pepper and salt to suit the taste. <laughs> I don't care much and I always leave proofreaders to quiddle if they like. She also depended on copy editors to correct her often problematic spellings. She had particular trouble with EI and IE words. <laughs> Nevertheless, she did care about her words. In describing the changes between the 68, 69 and 1880, <laughs> editions of Little Women. Phillips and Iceland state, although there are no major transformations of the novel's structure or plot, the revisions in wording do modify the characters and setting, as well as the rhythm of the sentences. Because these editors had only printed text with which to deal, they had to decide which changes were Alcott's alone, which were done in consultation with the publisher, and which were the compositors and or the publishers. For these reasons, it's hard to judge an author's style when all we have to go by is a printed text, one that has both suffered and been improved upon by numerous intermediaries. An amanuensis who's made a fair copy for the press, an editor or a compositor or a proofreader. With a manuscript, and especially with a manuscript that's sent to the printer, we know exactly what Alcott wrote, what changes she made in the manuscript, and what changes were made by others in the manuscript. We hope some of you will take, in the audience, will take up the challenge to further study Alcott's style and what the revisions mean in terms of her approach to authorship. You might also feel like a student at my university recently did after looking through Emerson's corrections in the Proofs of the American Scholar Address. I felt more connected to the past and to Emerson himself than I have all semester. I was able to examine not only his script, but his thought process as he went through his work. Daniel will now conclude. As we can see this evening from our brief look at various Alcott manuscripts, a careful examination can tell us much about a writer's process. These documents do indeed reveal valuable information about the interaction of author, publisher, editor, or illustrator. Alcott worked hard as a professional author and she did care about the finished product, whether the text on a page 
or an illustration of one of her fictional characters. As she once confessed in her journal of 1874, duty chains me to my galley. Louisa May Alcott in 1887 wrote the journalist and author Frank Carpenter, my methods of work are very simple. My head is my study, and there I keep the various plans of stories for years sometimes, letting them grow as they will till I am ready to put them on paper. Then it is quick work as chapters go down word for word as they stand in my mind and need no alteration. I never copy since I find by experience that the work I spend the least time upon is best liked by critics and readers. We can see by that comment that Alcott is not being entirely truthful here. Her comments make for a nice myth. Always the careful writer, she indeed returned to her manuscripts. And these manuscripts now help dispel the myth that she herself created. After all, the only way to seriously approach what an author wrote is to see exactly what the author wrote. And that's what these manuscripts, from Little Women to Under the Lilacs, allow us to do. The manuscripts we discuss tonight, of course, are only a part of the Alcott Collection here at the Concord Free Public Library. Many other treasures reside in special collections, from personal letters of the Alcott family to other manuscripts such as the two chapters from Little Men and the recently acquired Eight Cousins. While it is still a thrill for people to hold in their hands the actual manuscript that Louisa May Alcott wrote, these leaves have a deeper story to tell. To return to Leslie Wilson's words, it is the research value of these manuscripts that yields their treasures. And we hope that future readers and scholars will be able to discover them. Thank you. When I was listening to the uh, presentation about Under the Lilacs, it, it, I remembered that I had acquired recently uh, some volumes of St. Nicholas, the bound volumes, mm -hmm. and I have Under the Lilacs. Very I just, nice. I just looked it up and I have it. <laughs> and I also have eight, uh, eight cousins too. So this now this, this just like opened this whole new... You can bring them in and look at the manuscripts. <laughs> I, exactly, yeah. Wherefore? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Sir. Sure. Style manuals done by, let's say, the New York uh, book publishers. When did they start coming into common use? Was it more like the 20s to 40s? I let's see, late 19th century. Bob, style manuals came into common use mid to late 19th century? Probably. You know more than Yeah. Because I know they were pretty detailed from mid to late 50s. Yeah, the, the, they what, were strictly yeah. adhered to by, by people who would be yeah, together. But, but one of the problems was that there was no Chicago manual of style. There was no one agreed upon style sheet, so you had multiple style books competing with each other. And, uh, it's interesting how the collaboration was important in those mm -hmm. places. And they found the right people to work with over time. Yeah. Critical. Bob? So, actually, that raises the thought that it's really in the 1920s, 1930s, when editors like Maxwell Perkins become famous for working with writers and helping to remake their work. I think we, we created the idea of the editor in relation to the author that never existed really as a norm. And so, you know, what, what your lecture suggests is that publishing involves much more of the publisher as bookseller than authorizing the various aspects of any work in the print, and the author as the provider of the good that will be renamed to a commodity. Would that yeah. be? Uh, yeah, because the idea of a, almost a celebrity editor like Perkins uh, was unknown in the 19th century. That was not a function. That's what the publisher did. And I think the closest person to that would have been Fields, because he had a very Amongst, rare amongst publishers, he had a personal commitment 
to the authors he published. Uh, he was friends with most of them. He and Annie had that literary salon in Boston uh, and so forth. Uh, but I can't think of an example for the 19th century of someone like Perkins taking this massive stuff from Thomas Wolfe and turning it into a book. When did he turn to magazines like Fuller, editing thoroughly the dial? Mm. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Bob. When did he turn to magazines like Fuller, editing thorough for the dial? Oh, I think magazine pop editors uh, wielded a blue pen easily. Fuller and the Dial, uh, Lowell with Thoreau's writings. Um, but that was different because their job was to get that work into shape to fit in that issue of the journal. Um, and they were editors. They weren't the publishers. Um, you know, the closest thing to that would be uh, Elizabeth Peabody and Aesthetic Papers, where you had one person doing the same thing, or Lowell with The Atlantic, or uh, fields where they serve the same function. Yes? I'm just wondering if you know much, or Bob might, about George Palmer Putnam, who was a bit along those lines, and I think was mm. a relation of the Peabody's from yeah. Salem. George Palmer Putnam, kind of yeah. yeah. George Palmer Putnam was a partner in a, field, a firm called Wiley and Putnam, which in the 1840s got this idea of countering the idea that American literature doesn't count with publishing a series called Wiley and Putnam's Library of American Books. It included such wonderful books as Poe, Margaret Fuller's um, uh, books, reviews uh, of, of essays, papers on literature and art, um, Melville's Tide P. Uh, it was an astonishing uh, book, um, series. Um, Putnam went over to England and did a lot of recruitment of uh, authors from over there. But he was more of a factotum than he was an editor. Now, I don't get the sense in any of the work I've done with Poe or um, oh, Hawthorne also, uh, The Tales, uh, or Melville or um, Thoreau, uh, not Thoreau, but Fuller, that Putnam was any more than someone who pushed the book forward. Um, even you know, the, the doyen of the New York book scene at that time, Ever Dykink, was someone who supported authors rather than got down in the nitty gritty. You know, the closest thing to, to that was uh, taking Herman Melville into his library and see, hey, her book's Herman. And Melville said, I'm going to have fun now. Uh, but you know, the hands-on type of editing, I don't think they did. did that answer your question, Megan? Uh, by the way, there's a superb biography of Putnam by Ezra Greenspan that goes into very, very good detail on that. Uh, saw a hand in the back of the room. Yes. Well, we, we appreciate that because you'll have to re buy new copies of those books you just <laughs> tore apart. <laughs> One, one of the nicest things an author, and I'm, none of you in this, this audience will uh, agree with me, one of the nicest things an author can hear is, I've used or read your book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh. So what do you think the chances are that there are other caches out there of good manus working manuscript material? Um, there is always possibilities. Uh, this material came up to light two years ago. No one knew it existed. Um, you never say never. Um, not every attic in New England has been cleaned out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking for it on eBay. <laughs> yes, sir. I only deal with facts. <laughs> um, I don't know that I really have an answer uh, to that question. Um, if, if I look at Alcott in, in her own career, um, especially once she signed with Roberts Brothers, um, 
And that was a relationship with La which lasted for 20 years, right, from uh, 1868 until her death uh, in 88. It's very clear if you look at the Niles Alcott correspondence, a lot of which still exists, fortunately. Um, it's very clear who's in charge of the works, how they are to be uh, published in the sense of whether she's going to allow works to be serialized, whether she's going to allow certain illustrators to work with her. Um, so at least in Alcott's own career, she was very much that independent uh, sort of take charge woman and the, her editor who, you know, essentially almost ran the publishing company, uh, listened to her, I think, very, very carefully. That's about what I could say for that. I, I would also add that I think she's made quite a comment in the fact that in Little Women Part Two, how much do you see of the father? <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sorry. wasn't saved? Um, was it just more of a question of just manuscripts weren't saved in those days mm -hmm. when they were done with them? Or do you think it was more of a conscious decision on her part that she didn't want them saved? Do you have any ideas about that? Well, <clears throat> I think at that time, those manuscripts weren't sa worth saving. Uh, there were very, you know, the real auctions of material, um, really auction catalogs date from the 70s and 1870s and 1880s. And the idea that a text mattered made collection uh, of these manuscripts not very highly wanted. Uh, in fact, the idea that text mattered uh, is a fairly recent thing. My colleague, Matt Brookley, uh, went to New York in the 1960s and bought the gallery proofs to the Great Gatsby for $1,000. Because <laughs> who the hell cares about this? The book came out. Uh, so you know, the idea that this type of literature value uh, would have monetary value. It was a very new thing, comparably speaking. Uh, let, me, let me add to that also. Um, I, you know, in, in sort of one of my uh, quotes from uh, John Preston True, who was, when he wrote to Louisa, uh, was a, an aspiring writer and later would, would go on to become uh, a very serious writer. Uh, I indicated in that quote that you know he he wrote her about both her writing process, but he is clearly asked her to send him an old manuscript. Now, was he already thinking that this is something of value? Is this maybe you know one of his favorite authors, and he wants to collect that? And of course, her reply is, "No, I don't keep that." You know, I don't, I don't keep that material. Um, so, you know, as we think of Louise's uh, material, a lot of it obviously was just, you know, thrown away by the, the, the publishers and the press. Uh, but it's very possible that even some of her drafts of earlier things were actually sent out to admirers, you know, who wrote among the thousands of letters that she received, you know. It wouldn't surprise me. So, you know, maybe there is still hope that out there somewhere, check your attics. There, there's sort of a, uh, a subgenre in the 19th century of, dear author, uh, I love your works, would you please send me an autograph? And the, the ones that I like the best are the author who writes back and says, under no circumstances will I send you an autograph. Signed author. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, uh, the um, ability of people to understand the value of a literary text as opposed to, like I was talking about, a week inscribed to Hawthorne uh, was very different back in the 19th century. No one really cared about textual transmission to any extent. So it, it just wasn't necessary. And it led to you know, some of the great barbarisms of the early 20th century when Houghton Mifflin, who was basically the publisher of the New England canon, decided wouldn't it be nice to put out the so-called manuscript edition. So they did the manuscript edition of Emerson and Edward Emerson, went, they went to Edward Emerson who said, yeah, I got all these later lecture manuscripts sitting around. I don't know what the hell to do with them. So take a, you know, take a hundred and put them in the book. So each volume, each set came out with 
a page of Emerson's manuscript tipped into the front. And uh, Mifflin went to, I think it was Frank Sandburn, and said, we're going to do the same thing with Thoreau. You got any miscellaneous Thoreau pages laying around? So you have all these manuscripts by Thoreau dispersed. Um, the worst example of that was the so-called uh, limited edition of Frank Norris's writings, where they took the entire manuscript of his most famous book, McTeague, and broke it up one page at a time to put in these editions. Not only did they not tip this into the page, into the first book, but the SOBs put the manuscript in a folder that they laid into the first page. So anybody who opened it up would have it fall on the floor and separate from the edition. Uh, so does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Sir. Um, yes, my, my question is, uh, and this may uh, be a very uh, long-winded question, but what, uh, what, does, what does the digital age do to this whole process? Yeah. Which whole process? The, the ed ed editing and manuscripts and, and text. And well, what it's done is, and... The library here has been in the forefront under Leslie, <clears throat> making your collections available to the world. You know, I, you know, 10 years ago, I had to go to the Houghton Library to use almost anything. And Leslie Morris has really spearheaded the digitization of material at the Houghton so other people can use it, particularly with the fraught Emily Dickinson uh, copyright issues, uh, with Melville's marginalia and the copies of his books so that people all over the world can use these materials. Uh, it's just opened up all sorts of uh, avenues for scholarship uh, that weren't there before. It's been a it's godsend. You know, when Leslie and I were doing uh, the Emerson iconography, uh, we went to the end of the internet <laughs> looking for images of Emerson and also the ones that weren't of Emerson. Uh, but we found things there that you know, the National Library uh, and Archives in Britain National Archives here all had digitized their carts to disease and cabinet photographs. So stuff that we couldn't identify through normal means, we could see up there on the internet. Yes, sir? Once it's all digitized, building on Arthur's question, does it matter anymore? Does what matter anymore? <laughs> Do the manuscripts, the written material matter anymore? Oh, it? yes. <laughs> when you look at a digitized picture, you're looking at a two-dimensional picture. You can see there's been a revision, but you can't see what's been revised. You can't see, for example, pencil writing that's been erased. You can't see what's, uh, what's called an ink wipe. People would write in ink and say, whoops, I made a mistake. <laughs> wipe it out. You can sometimes recover that by turning it over and if the librarian's not looking, put a very bright flashlight on the other side <laughs> to get it up. You can, you, you can raise a raised pencil. <laughs> you can raise a raised pencil writing by raking light on it from an angle. That's not up there. Uh, if to get that quality from a digitized image requires someone who can really manipulate the image in a very professional way, and most people don't consider that part of their job in putting something up on the web. The web is a great way to look at something. And it's a great way to say, these are the things I need to come to the Concord Library to examine in person to see what is actually there. I like that <clears throat> picture Daniel showed of the flap that was over the head. Uh, if you came here, Leslie will take her X-Acto knife and pry it up so you... <laughs> <laughs> I've come very close to that. <laughs> but I can always come back as Bob's research assistant. <laughs> I think we should give Joel and Dan a hand. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, thank you. I've been performing Louis Mayon cut around the country for 25 years. 
Yes. Very nice. Yes, it is. Thank you. Christian, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jerry. <laughs>